Welcome back for the Book Mavens. I'm Amanda, she's Rachel, and we are going to share a little March wrap up with you. So we did Mystery March, which I'm sure if you're following on our channel, you already saw all those videos, but Rachel and I both often are reading multiple things besides the book that we share with you on our channel. So we thought we'd do a little March wrap up because we were both excited about the books that we read, but for diff very different reasons. <laughs> Rachel, yeah. take it away. What have you been reading in March, aside from our mutual mysteries? Well, <clears throat> I had another book club going on where we were reading Jade City. And I had finished Jade City in February, so I'm not going to talk about this. But I did... Sorry, I was just making sure it was recording. It is. Continue. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I could have told you. <laughs> but okay. Um, I'm just like, never no. mind. <laughs> anyway... So in March, I did finish up uh, the Green Bone Saga, is what it's called. Um, I had I had read this one in February, but I read uh, Jade War and Jade Legacy in March, so I finished this up. I and I did kind of I did really push myself through um, to finish these uh, because at the time it was it was about me that I needed to get going all of our mystery books, so I really powered through. Now. Um, I had talked about Jade City previously, but I just want to kind of reflect overall for the entire trilogy. I really enjoyed it. I didn't initially love the first book because I thought it was really predictable. I'm not going to lie. Um, <laughs> but uh, the character development gets better to me in the later books and it wraps up well. It covers a lot of time. I mean, from the first book to the last book, I mean, you're covering like 25 years of things moving, I'm like roughly like around 20, 25, something like that. I mean, it's a great deal of time mm -hmm. to cover in the span of three books and all with the same characters and adding new ones. It was, it was really good. I mean, if you're somebody who likes crime family kind of deal, like Godfather, but you add in, and well, I mean, it's not even like a, like a complex magic system. It's just that if you are somebody from this tiny island, it's supposed to be Mama kind of after Japan. So if you're somebody who really likes a lot of like Asian inspired fantasy, absolutely, absolutely do this. Um, but like Jade, if you're from this and you're a green bone, this just means that you have an innate ability to use Jade and it kind of mm -hmm. gives you superpower abilities. So you can um, kind of be able to like tune into people's emotions. You can um, enhance strength and be able to shield and to be like lightness and to be able to like jump really high and all kinds of weird stuff. Um, all very much defensible and offensible skills. Um, but like the whole thing is centered around the control over Jade and the fact that a drug had been manufactured to allow others who aren't green bones to be able to access this kind of Jade magic. And so it's really the whole thing is a struggle between two families in terms of their different ideologies in terms of how to control Jade and also to be able to maintain power over this island. And so there's a lot of inter-family politics going on. There's an outward more like, I guess, macro level, right? <laughs> By, um, of uh, maintaining power and different leadership abilities and how that works out is very interesting. Um, and because you spend so much time with these characters to watch them change and evolve was really good. They're very well written. Honestly, I didn't, I didn't think I was going to love it after I had read the, the first one, but really the second and third book really pull it out for me. This, this is a good series. I might revisit this in a couple of years and see how it, how it goes um, on a second read, but I recommend these. For anybody, high fantasy, it's a complex world, dense information, a lot of characters initially, but they all kind of sort themselves out. So like, I think like midway through the second one, you know who everybody is, you know the history, you're really comfortable in the story, but that's a time commitment. So you have to kind of decide what you want to do. But yeah, high fantasy readers, if you like a lot of crime drama, like crime family, Godfather fans, any kind of Asian history, awesome. Uh, Fonda Lee is a um, martial artist, so all of her fight scenes are, are really I well like coordinated. So it really feels like whoever is talking about they really know what they're talking about. So uh, yeah, I would recommend these. These were good. I liked them a lot. Did I ramble enough about them? I like it. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, they were good. They're very violent. Cool. They're very violent. <laughs> but um, 
another thing I want to talk about about these is when we talk about like being able to root for characters and you guys know if you've been watching the channel for a while I like to have characters to root for and these books put me in a tough spot because <laughs> it's it's you love them in terms of how much they love their family but they're so incredibly ruthless and like one of the characters in here who who is head of um, one of the families, he he does something in here that I was like, I don't think you could ever, I can that you don't can ever me, redeem your no, I'm not <laughs> yourself to me. But this this idea where you're constantly in this state of conflict because really, they're gangsters, like they're <laughs> they're they're they are, involved they in crime. Yeah, it's organized crime, and but. It's like the whole thing where people talk about the Godfather, right? I mean, you have these characters that you love, but they I mean they all do really terrible things. I mean, they're all capable of killing you. They don't really worry that much about it, and it's built into their culture. And uh, that's a little tough as a reader. Like, oh, I don't, I don't know how I feel about that. So, um, as a reader, in terms of like what I'm looking for for characters, I was very like. <laughs> <laughs> I struggled with it. I was very conflicted through a lot of it, but it made for a really interesting, very involved reading experience. So if you're somebody who's like that too, you're going to be like, you're going to struggle with it a little bit. You have to kind of like wrap your mind around it, but yeah, it was still really good. I still highly recommend these. Okay. So during Mystery March, we started the Lady Sherlock series and I loved it so much that I've already read the next two. <laughs> So I'm three into the six books that are currently out. I read, um, so we read The Study in Scarlet Women together, and then I read um, Scandal in Belgravia and Hollow of Fear. So I'm on the fourth book, Art of Art of Theft, Art of, Art of the Thief, or Art of Theft. I don't remember, sorry. So I've really enjoyed that series, and I'm, I'm keeping on moving through them. They get even better. I just keep asking her how the situation with Lord Ingram is continuing because I was... You need to read it. I was let very me tell you about that. That sounded very... You need to read Scandal in Belgravia. All right. Actually, no. You Well, you have to to get to Hollow of Fear. You're going to have to read them in order, but like... <laughs> I need to read these books. You're going to like them. So okay. I've been really enjoying that series, and I will be done with it pretty, pretty soon here at the rate I'm going. Cool, cool, cool. Thank you. So you would recommend that... Oh, 100%. That if you... Yeah, after you don't reading that first one, read them. read them. Just read them straight through. So good. And they're just so getting good. better. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. interesting how they do it because there is like the larger story, but mm -hmm. the cases that they're involved, like um, Scandal and Bill Gravia is based off of a very well-known Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, Sherlock Holmes case. Like they, they've they got tenets and tomes, but the whole while the, the, the plot line between like Ingram and Charlotte and Moriarty it just continues to develop. It's it's really well done. I'm really enjoying it. Cool. I'm going to I'm going to pick them back up. I think it's just so hard with my massive TBR staring at me to then pick up one. Well, I, I borrowed the rest of them for my friend so they oh, look at so that helps. So they that does help. they all are physically sitting here looking so at me. Also, at I borrowed them. So, you know, I feel I want to finish and return. When the books are actually physically they're staring at you, you feel I feel like greater pressure that they need you have to read those first. I mean, it's yeah, like, that's it's that's so fair. Tough. That's fair. Especially I feel that way especially if I borrowed it like either at the library or whatever because there's a time. And that being okay. said, I'm going to talk about books that I only have digitally because um well, number one, I want special editions for these other two trilogies that I'm going to talk about. So I've kind of like hesitated about buying physical copies, but I did read them digitally. And um, yeah, so <laughs> so you all know from our Seven and a Half Deaths of Evelyn Hardcastle read that I really struggled when I reached about like the halfway point in terms of sticking with it. I said, I have to set this aside or I'm going to burn myself out and... I, I just don't, I never want a reading experience to be totally miserable. Mm -hmm. So sometimes if you can walk away and take a break, then you come back to it and it's bearable again. <laughs> so that was my goal. So I said, okay, I had seen these books kind of talked about around like book talk and, you know, various book oriented things that I pay attention to. <laughs> and uh, there was this one series and it's by Raven Kennedy and it's the Plated Prisoner series. And there's going to be four books, I think. Only three are out right now. So I'm like, well, I'm going to pick it up. I'm going to see what all the fuss is about. So then I read all three in the span of 48 hours. 
because I just, oh, the first two are very short to be fair, like only like 580 digital pages, like they're really short. So like, I just bounce from one to the other and I'm like, well, I have to see how it ends. And now the third book is twice as large as the first two. So there's quite a size difference. Mm -hmm. And um, this is like, okay, so the Play to Prisoner series, there are some major trigger warnings for that. Um, they are definitely more on the spicy side, but that being said, it really only happens tremendously so in the third book. But uh, the first one has, the first one is the one that I would say there are trigger warnings for because rape is something that's talked about, something that happens in that book. So if that's a sensitive topic for you, I would not recommend this series for you. Um, but it's a takeoff of King Midas, like the King Midas myth. And uh, you have this woman, Orin, who is our main character, and she's gold. She's a golden lady. And uh, she's got these cool, like, appendages on her back. It's very, um, she calls them her ribbons. Mm. And they can, like, do stuff. It's pretty, it seems so silly talking about it, but it works in the book. I'm all just going to say it works in the book. And, <laughs> um, and it's really talking about a woman who, who feels incredibly unsafe and identifies someone as a savior and allows this person to take absolute control over her life. Mm. Um, That's never a good idea. In this idea of keeping her safe and her realizing that freedom's more important than just being safe. Mm -hmm. And kind of going with her on that journey is really fascinating. I really liked it. I, I would I say that it's the best written book series of books I've read? I read no. Um but is the story intriguing? Yes. Are there characters you're going to root for? Yes. Is there an interesting romantic interest? Yes. <laughs> right? So, if you like the whole kind of enemies to lovers, which is what happens and having kind of a uh, somewhat morally gray character going on and then a really great villain that really develops Mm, yeah yeah <laughs> it's good also there's elements of fam found family if you like that kind of trope as well and really a lot of self-discovery and finding your own kind of inner strength and be able to make decisions for yourself and um consequences of doing so whether or not they're worth it is uh is really i really liked it i'm really much i'm very looking i'm very much looking forward to the fourth one i think it comes out in december so i have quite a wait but quite a wait that one's good. Read a lot of trilogies, it seems like, uh, this month. So the next trilogy I read, I read those over our spring break period. I read the Winter Night trilogy, which is really highly rated. Um, it's Russian mythology based and they are beautifully written. Um, so stark and people talk about it. Like you really feel what cold feels like mm. when you read them and yeah I mean Russian talking about like northern climes of Russia mm, cold. it's chilly there <laughs> and it's mm -hmm. illustrated very well the the because I read them so close together I read them back to back to back that I got a little I think toward in like a quarter into the third one where I probably think my reading experience would have been better if I had set it aside and read something else and then went back to it and I didn't so I kind of like pushed myself through um, but overall, I think they were really, really masterfully written. You see a lot of character development. I don't love our main character. I don't, but it never took away from my enjoyment because so much of the Russian mythology elements in there, she writes those so well. Mm. And that kind of, I think, made my kind of overall dislike I had for the main character. She makes a lot of really dumb decisions, but she's young. And so like, I get it. It, it fits, but I don't like reading people making really dumb decisions. Dumb. <laughs> I really don't. Um, not always. Well, that's my and, problem uh, with Emma, if you recall. Oh, there you go. But she makes several. So several. Um, several things. And I just, and I still don't know for sure and in terms of how they ended, if she ever really gets to a point where she becomes a likable character for me, she's just kind of annoying. <laughs> she's annoying. You annoy me with she your does, but the setting, fabulous. Because it's taking place. Um, I really recommend that you read the author, the author's note at the end, 
like acknowledgements. It's like after that where she talks about a lot of the influence. She based a lot of this off of real historical events in Russian history, like in the 1300s mm -hmm. or so, um, where you had all of these kind of isolated, um, or isolated, but you had all these princes of Russia and this idea of them finally banding together um, against an outside force and what that looked like. And they talk about what happens with Christianity coming in and what happens to the, to like the more um, paganistic, I don't even want to say that, but just like the belief in all of these other kind of mythological creatures running around and how these things are interacting together. And when one tries to overpower the other and how it affects everyone. And she just writes it in this kind of what if, what if this situation happened? <laughs> you know, it's, I'm not describing that well, but she really, um, it's worth reading it because it puts everything into perspective about answering this question. And it's one that I've asked myself before studying history, especially religious history in terms of storytelling is like, what happens to that faith when another one comes in? And if this idea that these creatures are real, right? And you have this other religion coming in that's also real. Is there like a battle? What happens? And the way they talk about it is like when you lose belief in something, they fade away and cease to exist while this other more powerful religion takes over. But could they live together as one? It's just it's just a very interesting concept that I don't think gets explored that much in fantasy that I kind of wish did. So um, anyway, great historical elements. The, why did I say I ramble? I don't have you to talk to, I ramble. Um, Winter Night reference. Trilogy, Bear and the Nightingale is the first one. Um, I, I do recommend them. I think they're really beautiful books. They're not tremendously long. If you like a lot of folklore and mythology in your books, I highly recommend it. To me, those are the most well-developed elements of the story, for sure. Let's talk about Nancy. <laughs> okay, Nancy Warren. Post Robin Hobb, as part of my palate cleanser, I fell for a Facebook ad which was a series of very cute and charming, although not particularly well-written, um, cozy books about a vampire tea room. Okay, this led me to Nancy Warren, who the, the quality of the writing is much better, and I read all 13 of the Vampire Knitting Club. Okay, I got to 13 and sad it's over. So I tried, Nancy has other series. One is called The Great Witch's Baking Show, <laughs> which is exactly what it sounds like. She, there's a mystery about her birth. She was orphaned, or well, she was abandoned as a child. She was left at a bakery. Well, of course. Um, and then she gets on the great witching it's the great british baking show essentially although they can't call it that you know because you know trademark so she gets on the show because of the manner in a behind the scenes documentary about the manner she saw uh in a portrait a blanket that was the same blanket she had been abandoned with it's like her only clue to who she is so each book is an episode of the show like it's a weekend at the manor while they film this show so <laughs> I'm in the second one and I'm thoroughly enjoying myself. But I started this one because I started, I actually started the Vampire Book Club first. Okay, this witch, she does something really bad, like real bad, like breaks one of the fundamental rules. And so as part of her punishment, they make her go trade lives with this woman in Ireland. Mm -hmm. And there's a crossover character from the Vampire Knitting Club, although like the crossover is pretty minor, but you know, Rafe did show up recently oh, with wow. Sylvia and and Lucy's grandma. <laughs> not not really part of the story. But um <laughs> because a character who often showed up in the Vampire Knitting Club, mm -hmm. who was Irish, actually lives in this village. So anyway, she takes over this lady's bookshop and I was reading two of them and then I was like, I'm on Nancy's Facebook group, which I adore. Um, and I, but I realized based on the comments that that's actually the series she's currently writing. So I think there's only maybe three or four of them out and another one's coming soon, but she's not very far along in that series. And that the pace I go through them, I decided I probably needed to slow down. So I switched to the Great Witches Making Show. And I haven't been disappointed. They are absolutely, it's like eating a bag of potato chips. I just 
can't stop and I enjoy it and it's not, you know, it's not terribly stimulating in terms, like, am I thinking deeply about anything? No. Am I having a delightful little romp? Yeah, I am. I love Nancy. Her Facebook group is called Nancy's Knitwits. K-N-I-T. Because, you know, there's a lot of knitting in, in the, you gotta, you gotta be a part of the group to get it. But let me just tell you, it's delightful. And shout out to the group. I'm enjoying us. I'm enjoying you immensely. I mean, this is a form of escapism for you. There's something wrong sure. with this idea of being able to just kind of mentally unwind and not get caught up in a super complicated, emotionally devastating story. I mean, there's a lot of gatekeeping, I think, that happens with books and mm -hmm. literature and a lot of judgment. People should be able to read whatever they read want. What you want. Read what you want. I will say the the narrator for the Vampire Book Club, was, I had a harder time switching over. And I don't know if it's because I had really enjoyed the narrator of the Knitting Club ones or what, I don't know what about it it was, but it took me a little while. I By speeding it up, that helped. Um, and I will say this, because they keep, they have to keep switching accents because the character is, the main character is usually American or American raised in the case of the great witching baking show. Because she's really British, but she's raised in America. It's, it's a whole thing. It's a whole thing. <laughs> it's a whole thing. But like the, this one takes place in Ireland. And so in trying to, it's the same narrator doing multiple Irish accents, like trying to do, and so that she's trying to distinguish them in a way that was hard for me to listen to. It just wasn't clicking with me. But by speeding it up and just powering through, I, I, I'm getting there. But she's, yeah, she's older. She's 45. She, I can't, I don't want to tell you what you did. She did, because you need to read it for yourself. But, like. It's nice, too, to have a female protagonist that's not, It know, is like nice. 19. Yeah, it's nice. Know? I mean, and none of them are. Lucy's in her mid-20s in the Vampire Knitting Club. Oh no! Oh no! She's getting into her late twenties. She's like in her late twenties. Um, this the Great Witches one. I'm not sure. I think she's, I think she's mid to late twenties as well. But if I if I read it, I missed it. But like I said, I'm only on the second, the second episode because you know each book is an episode of the show. Second episode. But she didn't know she was a witch until one of the hosts of the show, who is a witch by the way, uh, informed her that that's why. You know, things kept happening the way they were for her. Let me tell you, I love them. If you want to talk about the Vampire Knitting Club, though, I'm here for it. I'm here for it. I made Rachel, like, I've just subjected her. I made her read the first one. I did. It was cute. It was cute. And then she did not read the other 12. <laughs> Look. Only, only mildly <laughs> disappointed by. But it's fine. You can read what you want. She's reading, like, and trilogies, I do. <laughs> and I'm just powering through these shows. You just read a 12 book series. I mean, you want to stop by quantity, I'm at 13. So you, I mean, because the last one is the best one. No, and I, no, and I love them. I'm just, I, I tell, I make her listen to me while I talk about them. I didn't want to read the last book of the Vampire Knitting Club, she which did. I probably read into she February, really, early March, somewhere in there. She really struggled. I really struggled, really struggled because I didn't want it to be over, but I also really needed to know what Lucy decided. It's a conundrum. <sighs> Lucy's a witch and she falls in love with a vampire and that's not giving anything away. So you can just imagine that uh, clearly choices have to be made. And I'll let you know, I was actually, I mean, I was kind of just, I was like, I don't, just don't know how she's going to wrap this up and I'm going to be okay with it. All right, Nancy, you did. Amanda told me what happens in the end and then she got mad at me with oh, my wait, reflections. Because she <laughs> kept <laughs> the she got, she got mad at me. <laughs> she was, I mean, not like, like she came mad, for, she, she was came annoyed. for my, she came for one of my favorite characters in the book, and I was like, I did. How dare you? <laughs> First of all, you don't know him. <laughs> I don't. Not on you, this level. You don't know him. And second of all, he, it was her choice. She made the choices she made. I don't even remember exactly what you said about, about Ray. You now. were, you were. I but was upset. It was my planning period, and I was just like, "Don't you have to go? <laughs> go away. Take your I don't even opinions your, with you. Your cynicism." She came in there, I'll be an all cynical about my was, cozy, yeah. and it, she's like being so cynical about his character, and I was like, "Oh, I remember what it was. I remember what it was, but I don't want to sell it because I don't want to give away plot points, which is kind of important." So, 
They don't want to give up, give up the way, she the, the end well, of a 13 I can tell, book series. She thinks he's sacrificing nothing in the outcome, which I is don't. not true. I don't. It's not true. I think it's everything's a win, 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 win. Well, yeah. listen, she just ends up not really sacrificing in the end. Well, uh, I'm just saying, read it, guys. Right the Vampire out. Knitting Club. It's a delight. It'll get, <laughs> what a great debate book. <laughs> also, if you have read them, Please let me know in the comments. <laughs> she desperately talk, talk about it. Know. I would love to talk about it with someone who else who has also read them. Thank you. <laughs> right, well, the last two books I'm going to talk about. Um, as I I keep talking about wanting to get into science fiction, and I keep setting aside my science fiction books. So, yeah, since the Red Rising trilogy, which I haven't read the last two books, I do have them. They're in my. Oh, excuse you, sir. I'm knocking over my books. Um. <laughs> In my in my pile of <laughs> for my my April plan, um, I do have um, the the other two to the Red Rising trilogy. I'm going to try and knock those out so I can, you know, say I've read all of this author's work and be able to set it aside. But to get back into sci-fi um, without so much of a time commitment, I decided to read Ready Player One. Now I had featured this in in like mm -hmm. a TBR pile. I had read it, but I had set it aside. For other things and so I finally decided to pick it up because I actually really enjoyed the movie. I am somebody who very much embraces pop culture specifically. I don't know that I ever saw the movie sorry. 80s pop culture and so when I when I, I this is one of those rare occasions in which I saw the movie before reading the book and I just loved it because everything was about 80s movies, um, music, TV shows, everything. It was just so cool and I just felt so seen and <laughs> <laughs> So I was very excited to read the book and this book is so incredibly well researched. So, you know, it's a futuristic story where everyone is like, the earth is kind of just, it's just crappy. All right. The environment's taken a toll. Everyone, it's just an entire economic collapse. And the only escape people have is to go into the Oasis, which is like, um, this immersive video game experience. So, um, you have your avatar and you can earn money. You can do all kinds of stuff. So most people spend the majority of their time in the Oasis and the creation of the Oasis, just kind of some background, um, created this, this, uh, contest. And if you won the contest, then you inherit, you become his heir and you inherited this multi-billion dollar thing from creating the Oasis. And so everything about, um, the creator, he is heavily obsessed with everything 80s. Like that was his favorite decade. And so everything involving the clues Golden and everything. Choices. And, and because, I mean, you're talking about the most wealthy man on the planet, truly, that it creates this whole kind of like next generation of, of all of these kids that are obsessed with the 80s. It's just super fun. So well researched in terms of everything 1980s, the creation of video games. I am not somebody who plays video games. I am really, really terrible at it, and <laughs> I didn't, I never had a gaming system growing up where that would have been popular, so, like, for me to actually have learned those skills early on, so I just didn't. So, it's very interesting to me just to learn about, and they are so well-researched, like, meticulous. So, I finished the first one. I really, really enjoyed it. Um, it's an adventure, and I couldn't help comparing it to the film. It is not identical to the film. The film actually changes quite a bit, but I think it keeps the same kind of theme is in there. Um, I feel like the character development for our main character, uh, Wade, mm -hmm. stayed fairly true. They just changed a lot of, like, the competitive aspects um, were different. Um, they give him a lot more credit for solving all of the puzzles in the film or in the book, it's not really him mm. necessarily solving them all. Mm -hmm. And so it's, um, it's a little bit more expansive in the book, but excellent read, super fast, you'll zip through it. And if you're somebody who really likes the kind of retro stuff and all of the references in here, it's just such a treat to read all of that. I just love it. And then, um, I've started Ready Player Two. I haven't finished it, um, but a quarter in, and this one is a very different tone. So this is like after the contest, after the contest from the first book, and just poor Wade. This far into the book, I can't say much about it. Um, it's just not doing so well. He's making some questionable decisions, and I'm a little sorry for poor Wade. So um, 
And this is taking what, like right now, a quarter into the book, this is several years after the end of the first one. So we do, um, we do see bit, bits of time jumps happening and just, it's really sad right now and depressing. I'm hoping that it's going to pick up and some positive yeah. things happen. So uh, we'll see. And I'll let you know when I finish this up. And that was it. That was, that was, that was all our of March. my superfluous March reading the other like mysteries. It. Aside, yeah. yeah, so we're still, yeah, we're yeah. still us, even when we do challenges. <laughs> <laughs> we're still reading. I think it's just, you know, we are really prolific readers. So That's we fair. have our together projects and then we have other things we're reading on our own. Yeah. Like I'm still plugging along on my Japanese history book. 